the spectrum of pure white light is not visible to the human eye but color is and so color is the visible part of light like I said now color can make a huge impact on your viewer as well it's a very complex subject um, when I took color I took color theory in, in art school and I spent a whole oops sorry a whole semester on it sorry about that and so one of the first things you, you learn is how to use color color has uh, at its foundation combinations of colors that can go together and this 20th century invention that you're staring at called the color wheel, a basic one, uh, kind of indicates, she helps you as a tool to what colors can go together. When artists think of the color wheel, they think of the warm side and the cool side. The warm side are the colors here that are, the warm colors are like reds, oranges, yellows. The cool colors are the greens, blues, and purples, and they both have a feeling, if color can be said to have a feeling, but they can, you know, how they make you feel. So if you want warm colors, let's, let's go there because it's an easy example. For example, red. When we think of red, we think of terms like passion, love, anger, danger, warning. So all of those things are associated with red, and red is a very visually strong color. So you have to be very careful using red. And also red, if you wear it, for instance, as if you are into fashion, you draw the eye. Now cool colors tend to be more relaxing. They're more associated with nature. I always think of, you know, when I'm walking on the beach and I look at this, you know, the sky, and all the blues and the purples in there and it's just a such a soothing feeling to it so it gives you a different feeling so just think of that when you're thinking of meaning for a work of art look at the color look at the light there are different like I said at the beginning when I was talking about color color combination so let's talk about the three most common ones the first one we're going to talk about is monochromatic just like the word says mono one and then chrome greek one color okay monochromatic color scheme you use one color and it's uh tint i gotta explain that to you because i just realized i haven't tint and also shade a tint is when you add white to a color and a shade is when you add black to a color. Because black and white are achromatic, they never count in color schemes. All right, just when you're trying to identify one, do not refer to them. Just look at the color, but just also remember monochromatic includes tints or shades. For example, this is a monochromatic color scheme. Here you see this, it's more of a shade down in here and then you have more of a tint up in here, but it's still only one color. So that is still a monochromatic color scheme, a very basic color scheme. Analogous color schemes, a little more difficult to identify, are when the colors that are used together are very close to each other on the color wheel. So here you have all cool colors and a little bit of warm coming in here, but still they're very close to each other. And so if this one here would be somewhere up in, eh, it'd be about up in here, okay? You can identify analogous color schemes by actually thinking of if it's all cool or if it's all warm. It's probably analogous. But the most popular color schemes are complementary. Complementary color schemes are colors that are used that are opposite from each other on the color wheel, all right? here we have an example of orange and blue those are opposite from each other if you look here and there all right uh, this color wheel here is identifying a very popular color scheme and that's red and green red and green are associated with Christmas they have nothing to do with Christmas but they certainly work as a good marketing tool because when you get 
complementary colors and you put them next to each other, they pop each other up. They enhance it. And most popular color schemes are complementary. So we're referencing red and green, that's Christmas, orange and blue, a lot of sporting teams. Think of Florida. We have a lot of sporting teams that use that color combination. And a very popular one recently has been purple and yellow. I've seen that a lot. And again, it's just yellow next to purple is going to pop it and enhance it. And again, that too, I always think of yellow and purple as being, so you know, sporting teams. While I don't watch sports on TV, I have students who always tell me that, and I'm like, all right, well, they do that for a reason, so your eyes are drawn to them. Okay, so see that? A very dramatic color scheme. But look how that yellow couch pops out at you. I mean, you cannot avoid looking at this complementary color scheme this designer chose. Oops, sorry. This would be a, anybody um, have a guess, I know that uh, you're not able to respond, but in your own mind respond, analogous. Blues, some greens, and of course purple. Sorry about that. And then of course monochromatic. So these examples, I could show you hundreds of them. And then there's other color schemes that are more complex, but these are the basic ones, and those are the ones that are easiest for you to identify. We're going to also today conclude with talking about texture. And texture can be either actual or implied. Okay, all three-dimensional things have texture. Everything that you can touch has a texture. So for instance, I'm looking around me right now. I'm sitting in my office and looking for something that has texture. I really don't see anything right offhand. Everything's that well, smooth is a texture. But say for instance, I've shown this thing before. This is a little flashlight. It's got a ribbed texture right here. The plastic has a little design on it. So it's got that type of texture. And that's an actual texture because I can pick this up and I can feel this. Okay, but if it's a two-dimensional object, your texture is implied. It's not there, but the artist has to, you know, make it by either doing something like this, like making this kind of feeling of movement around, and you kind of feel this feeling of, you know, there's a texture building up. But actual texture is something that 3D people, you know, definitely are concerned with. Okay, it's a very famous piece from early in the 20th century. And actual texture is also something, if you're interested in interior design, that interior designers have to work with, and also garden design. You know, I always think of that when you're looking, I have a friend who's a garden designer, and what kind of textures you're going to put together. Look at this room. Uh, it's kind of plain. It's all really beige. You know, if I, if, if I was here, I would definitely put something more in more color to pop it out. Because even the artwork here is kind of beigey. But the thing that really makes this room is this wonderful texture on the table. Okay, so that's a great example of using texture to draw interest. And that's what you're doing. You're drawing interest. There can be actual texture. Let me move this up so you can see this definition here from a painting if you apply the paint very thickly. Uh, one of the most famous people for doing this technique, it's called impasto, was Vincent van Gogh. As you can see here in Starry Night, it's almost as if you see the texture, even in this reproduction of this reproduction. All right, we're seeing that, and it was very thickly applied and it stands out from the surface. It was a, his, something he was kind of, it was his signature. And of course, implied texture. There's no texture, but what implied texture does here uh, is it hooks into the part of your brain that can fill in stuff. You, if you've touched a rabbit, those of you who have touched a rabbit out there, close your eyes and think about what a rabbit feels like. It is the softest. I mean, it's even softer than a cat. Cats are pretty soft. Dogs are soft. Some of them more soft than others. But a 
grab it even softer and I can close my eyes and I can feel that texture because Albrecht Dürer, that was the name of this artist, he was good at texture. And, and, and you will see in the history of art, uh, there are certain people who are famous for texture and how well they do it. And he's just definitely one of them. In fact, all of the Northern artists during the Northern Renaissance become very, that's kind of their signature thing, implied texture. And then textures can make things fun. They can tell you things. Here you know this dude here. He's got uh, some pretty rich looking clothes on. As I had one student tell me, inform me, he got rags. And I was like, he does. Definitely. He's <laughs> the king of Spain. Man, he has got some really beautiful clothing on here. And I can see the texture on it. And of course, texture to make you laugh, to make you look that fat cat with that beautiful fur the Mona Lisa is that much more interesting and we definitely you know want to see it so I hope you enjoyed that for today that is the end of the lecture for today this is lecture two part three I had to part it out it is a very kind of dense topic but you have to know the visual elements in order to design the, excuse, excuse me, to, in order to understand the design principles, which will be the next lecture that you'll be concerned with. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Peace out from History Surfer, Dr. A. Hello everyone, it's Dr. A from History Surfer. Today we're going to talk about light, color, and texture. So this is definitely, as you can tell, an art appreciation lecture. So let's start out with light. Because the vast, it's a complex subject, this whole thing. So I'm going to try to break it down. So it is, uh, you, can, you know, you can, you can get it all in because it could be very long, this lecture. So I'll try not to make it that. Let me just kind of adjust here so you can see this. This is what you're looking at is called a value scale. Light is talked about in art as a value. And the lightest light is a 10, a value of 10. And the darkest dark is a value of zero. This also is how we refer to black and white. Black and white oftentimes are called colors. You know, we talk about it that way. A lot of people do. But in art, we talk about black and white as a value. And light is the relative darkness or lightness of a surface. And everything has value. All colors have value. You just have to figure out where they fit into the value scale. It's a very strong thing to work with, so you have to really be aware of it. When you're working with value, you think about it in lightness. You think about how it's going to make an impact on your work. And as a photographer, light is my number one primary concern because I can really add a different feel to a work by either increasing or decreasing the value of the piece. If you have a piece like this that's overall light, it's referred to as a high key piece. And a high key piece has a certain feeling to it. It's more uh, uplifting. You can see the subject matter here. It suits it. Uh, the meeting between the dog and the horse. There's nothing here that is disturbing or that's going to bother you. You just feel like this is a nice moment. In contrast, if I put in something that is overall dark, like this particular piece, 
this is called a low key lighting. Then I have something that's more dramatic. Low key lighting definitely gets a feeling of something's happening. In this case, it's something bad. Instead of a meeting between, uh, you know, the dog and the horse, now we have between, I don't know if you can see it, I hope you can, the lion here and the horse. And with this overall low-key light it gives you that feeling of drama something is happening you know how when you watch a film and the light starts to get really dark and you know something bad's gonna happen that's the exact same thing and the reason why you use darkness absolutely I can light something very differently and make it feel very different now light can also you know tell you a lot about people so do not discard that or disregard I mean to say as a key to meaning for instance here we have high key light and even though the guy isn't really smiling you see his lips I mean that's not really a smile you feel that he's type of a jovial type of person well the mustache helps doesn't it but also because of the lighting the lighting is very high key in contrast look at this dude he looks like he's super serious. There's no feeling of lightness, no feeling like, hey, I could go out with him, we could have a good time. You know, if you were hanging with this dude, he'd be reading you that book. And so it's very different, you know, when I, when I use light this way, and I know that. And when I control it, and you can control it in printing, you can print things darker or lighter, you know, and you guys can do a lot with filters. I'm doing it for a reason. Light is also a super way to give character reference. Like I was just showing with that person, you know, here I have this cat and it's an intense image of a cat who obviously isn't nice. And so I can just call that. I don't even know this cat and I can just look at it and say, mean cat. Some people, artists, I'm talking about, sorry, I reference an artist, they use light as the main part of their work. And we have a lot of light being used today. It's very popular. You see a lot of neon. That's what I've noticed in the last like five years. And so light is the major component and that's what they work with. That's their medium, if you will. One of the great things about light is you can use it to give emphasis to an area and you, you can then give a clue to your viewers as to where you want them to look. For example, I'll show you one of my works. I took this, oh, let's go further, sorry. I took this image and I wanted the viewer to look here at the tree. For me, when I put the darkest dark against the lightest light, so let's go back to that, you can see that here it draws your attention to it. So here we have a strong triangle pointing you into the composition and then this very dark dark and this very light light. And the reason I chose the tree was at this particular place, it's a ruins in Mexico, Monte Alban. Um, you know, it just struck me when I was there of how this place used to have a hundred thousand occupants and now it has no one. The place is essentially dead, although there are remnants of something living. And that was the tree. It symbolized that to me. And the living part really is truly the memory of the Zapotecs in this region. If you're from the Mexico and you're from the region of Oaxaca, you may have been here. You know, they were a powerful entity and now they're gone. And, and that contrast helped me to draw people's eyes to that area. It's an important design element. You're going to, you know, learn about design next. But I just want to point that out to you. Light can help you in that function. Now, color is a component of light. And when we talk about color, we're talking about the visible part of light.